Hello, friends. Thank you for being here tonight. I know most of you, but a few new faces that I don't know. I'm Christy Trantina. I'm the Director of Adult Faith Formation for St. Joseph Church. So welcome, and thank you for being here, and this is going to be great. And I want to also thank Gabe, Dr. Ferrer, but who we all affectionately know as Gabe, for sharing his gifts with us. We are blessed to have him in our parish. So, Gabe, come on up. Let's go. So, thank you all. Uh, so I know many of you, but not everyone. My name is Gabe Ferrer. I've been a parishioner here for about 20 years, 21 years. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just had a bit of inspiration that wound up leading to this presentation tonight. So let me give an overview of how tonight and the other nights are going to go, and then we'll get started. I'm going to give some introductory remarks about the Gospel of Mark and the approach that I'm taking to it. Next, we've got um, four volunteers, each of whom are going to read one of the first four chapters of the Gospel of Mark. So that's going to be an opportunity to, in an in-depth way, just listen to, read along in your own Bible if you would like but just engage directly with the story that Mark is telling. After that, I've got a series of uh, three talks that I'm going to give, each about a different theme from the first four chapters. After each talk, I'm going to uh, suggest five minutes for quiet reflection, uh, prayer, going to the bathroom, stretching, uh, what have you and uh, we'll just see how things go. So, I uh, also want to say a special thanks to uh, all, everyone who has an adoration hour adjacent to mine is here tonight, and so I'll just <laughs> give a shout out to you guys. Uh, and, and just for the record, what hour is that? It's 2 a.m. Sunday morning. Um, if anybody's looking for an adoration hour. It's just me at 2 a.m. We're, we're definitely looking for a second. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, so, let's, let's go ahead and begin. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, in your infinite wisdom, you gifted the church with four biographies of your life and ministry. Four opportunities for each of us to have a personal encounter with you. Please be with us as we study the first of these with the goal of following you as you called your disciples. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, you know, we think about the four Gospels and it's often easy especially the way sometimes they're taught in Sunday school or whatever, to imagine that they just kind of dropped down from heaven and there they were and, and, and that was all there was to it. But that's not really how they came to be. Each gospel was written to solve a problem that the writer observed or perceived in the church. From there, the church discerned that that gospel constituted divine revelation. Generally speaking, these books, these gospels, weren't really even commissioned or planned necessarily by the church as an organization. The writers wrote them because they found them to be necessary. And the church then adopted them after discerning that they were true records of Jesus Christ. Because each gospel writer was responding to a different situation from a different point of view, each of the four gospels is very, very distinct. And that's a lot of what we're going to be exploring with regard to Mark over the next four weeks. Mark was probably the first gospel written. Probably. 
Scholars disagree to some extent, but the weight of the evidence is that Mark was the first one written. There isn't a lot of hard evidence about when or how Mark wrote his gospel. There's a lot of fragmentary evidence. That is, one or two sentence comments by various church fathers from the first couple of centuries make a suggestion here or there about what Mark was doing. In particular, several writers mention that what Mark was doing was recording the preaching of St. Peter, uh, specifically. But it, there's not, like I said, a lot of hard data about it. It's just comments here and there, and not much in the way of a chronology. Consequently, we can really only guess as to when it was composed. From what I've seen in the literature, the estimated dates range from about 45 AD to 75 AD. And just for reference, right, so the crucifixion, resurrection would have been about 29 AD. So if we're thinking about 45 AD, we're thinking about maybe 16 years later, uh, for example. Um, I've done a lot of reading about this sort of thing, and you know, you read study Bibles and such, and they'll often say, scholars think this, scholars think that. That was never really enough for me, and so I did quite a bit more digging beyond that. And the outcome of that is, I think it was written in 49 AD, and about 20 years after the events described. And this uh, idea came from a suggestion in a book written by the historian James Papandrea, where he mentioned, kind of offhandedly, that a possible reason for writing the Gospel of Mark was when Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in 49 AD. The expulsion of Jews from Rome in that year is documented both in the book of Acts as well as um, among a secular Roman historian who makes reference to it. And the Roman historian mentions that there was a dispute among the Jews of Rome, as he put it, instigated by Crestus. And so Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. And that was what he wrote. They were able to return in 54 AD after Claudius died. But at that time, the Romans were not making a hard distinction between Christians and Jews. And as we're going to discover, even the Christians themselves weren't really making a hard distinction between Christian and Jew. So behind that single sentence, you can imagine all manner of mischief involving arguments, fist fights perhaps, about whether or not Jesus was the Messiah and how people should behave as a consequence of that. So putting this together with some of the writings of the early church fathers then, we get Mark's motivation, that Mark compiled his gospel for the benefit mostly of the Gentile Christians in the city of Rome who no longer could hear Peter preach as he had been expelled among the other Jews in 49. So in that sense, Mark's gospel solves an immediate pressing problem. Deprived of the presence of the apostle, how do we preserve his preaching for the benefit of the Christians who remain? Peter ultimately returned to Rome and very ultimately died there um, a, a good number of years after that. Uh, but it turns out, when we read the Gospel of Mark attentively, this hypothesis about its composition makes a lot of sense of a lot of things. And we're going to explore those as we go. So what about the Roman Christians? So you got to think for a bit about what was the city of Rome like at this point in time. One way to think about it is to imagine New York City. What do I mean by that? When we think of New York City, we think of a big city, city of lights, and immigrants from absolutely everywhere. 
If you want a cuisine prepared anywhere on earth, you can find it in New York City. And that's what ancient Rome was like at this time as well. As the capital of the empire, it attracted a lot of immigration from all over the Mediterranean basin, basically. And those immigrant groups formed enclaves in the city of Rome. Now, the Jewish people in particular had spread throughout the Mediterranean basin, and in particular, many of them had adopted the most frequently spoken language in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greek. A couple of centuries before Christ, in fact, in what's now Alexandria, Egypt, the Jewish community there undertook a translation of the entire Old Testament into Greek. It's known as the Septuagint, and it's one of the most important copies of the Old Testament in existence. And the significance here is that when we think about the Jewish community in the Mediterranean, this is primarily a Greek-speaking community. And the same would have largely applied to the Jewish community in Rome, and also to many other immigrant communities, because Greek remained kind of a common language throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. And in many ways, even in Rome, Greek was something of a prestige language. And that's why Mark wrote his gospel in Greek. It's how he reached the widest possible audience. That said, another characteristic of Mark's gospel is that he was not a native speaker of Greek. By those who have expertise in Greek, doesn't include me, incidentally, the style of Greek in Mark's gospel is considered a bit rough, a bit amateurish, even. There are passages that read like direct translations of how someone speaking Aramaic would have very literally or in a wooden way translated something into Greek. And in fact, in three places in the gospel, Mark even quotes statements from Jesus in Aramaic, which would have been the everyday language Jesus spoke, and then gives the translation in Greek. And we're, we're going to encounter several of those as we go through it. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is what kind of writing is the Gospel of Mark? So we shouldn't think of it as a biography written the way a journalist or historian would write it. Everything Mark records is an event that happened, but he's not as concerned with chronology the way that a historian would be. He's much more concerned about the thematic relationships in the material. That is, how does organizing the material in a particular way convey the deeper underlying message that he wants to convey. So in a way, it's helpful to approach Mark and really all of the Gospels as uh, works of literature and thinking in terms of themes and motifs and the like is really helpful in understanding them. And that too is going to be something we're going to explore in depth. So I'm going to wrap up this introductory talk by mentioning three of the primary themes in the Gospel of Mark. And each of these themes will then be a subject of one of my talks this evening, how that theme is explored in the first four chapters. The first critical theme of the Gospel of Mark is the divinity of Jesus. The divinity of Jesus. Mark, in several places, somewhat uh, symbolically at times, but unambiguously, asserts the godhood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to explore some of those passages tonight. 
His divinity is further testified to by his miraculous signs and ultimately by his suffering, his death, and most critically, his resurrection. And that suffering, death, and resurrection is anticipated in many ways in several different forms throughout the gospel. The second major theme is the kingdom of God. And for Mark in particular, addressing a community of Gentile Christians who had been dealing with heated disputes with um, Jewish Christians and even Jewish non-Christians, emphasizes the degree to which both Jews and Gentiles are invited to be part of the kingdom of God. And that is a major, major theme of the Gospel of Mark. But what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is represented first and foremost by the forgiveness of sins. That is the work Jesus came to undertake. It's also characterized by not being obvious. The kingdom of God is not an obvious kingdom the way Rome is or whatever. It's subtle. It unfolds slowly over time. The kingdom of God is also an organized body of believers. It is an organized, manifest, public body. The third major theme that we'll be exploring is the theme of discipleship. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Key ingredients of discipleship are first and foremost repentance. If Jesus came to forgive sins, we have to repent of those sins before we're forgiven of them. Secondly, the disciple will experience cycles of consolation and suffering. There will be moments where you recognize the presence of Jesus and moments where his absence is painful. Consequently, the disciple must always be ready to take up their cross in following Jesus. Finally, even a sincere disciple will fail at times as a disciple, and the failures of the disciples are also a major theme of the Gospel of Mark that we will be exploring.